Archive 81, the brand new mini-series over on Netflix. Season 1 is done, so this will serve as my review, spoiler-filled, as well as an ending explained. What is Archive 81? Well, Archive 81 is developed and produced by Rebecca Sonnenshine, uh, along with Paul Harris Boardman and James Wan. So we have some pretty heavy hitters there. And it's actually a series based on the podcast of the same name, which follows researchers cataloging the video archive of a missing filmmaker. In the video film series adaptation, it actually follows one researcher, one archiver, Mamadou Athi, who plays Dan, and Dina Shahabi, who plays Melody Pendras. These two individuals are flung together when Dan, an archiver of the local museum, is given a Hi8 tape by the mysterious LMG owner Virgil Davenport, played by Martin Donovan, and very well played, uh, I must say. This series is actually a really, really good series, and I'm intrigued to see where it goes moving forwards. It sort of falls apart a little bit towards episode 5, however, it's intriguing enough for me to look forward to the season 2. The acting throughout from Mamadou Athi is actually very, very good. He plays quite a nuanced approach to his character of Dan, but Dina Shahabi, who plays Melody Pendras, plays a much more animated version of her character, and the flitting between the two individuals as our point of view characters throughout the season is actually complements one another in a very, very good way. So, in terms of the show itself, Dan is tasked by Virgil Davenport, essentially to archive, digitize, and go through, restore all of Melody Pendras's video footage. Melody Pendras is from 1994. This is the two time zones that we're looking at here. Modern day, Dan and Melody Pendras, 1994. Melody Pendras goes to the Vissa Apartments uh, for her PhD dissertation. She's looking to video uh, and document every single person that lives in the apartment building uh, for her dissertation. But, ladies and gents, enter the first trope of the show. She's also looking for her long lost mother, Jess, because she was an orphan, she was abandoned. So she's going to the Vista Apartments two-pronged dissertation, but also looking for her mother. And she believes that the people there have uh, the key, the information. Maybe she'll find her, or maybe they'll be able to point her in the right direction. Like I say, the trope of flitting between two different time zones actually works quite well here. So Dan, as he starts to watch the footage, we then flit to 1994 as if we're there. Because we are. We are actually watching Melody's progress unfold. And it works really, really well. It's uh, very expertly shot, and there are two directors that are some of my favourites in the business today. They direct two episodes, and that is Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. And uh, they do a really, really good job, actually. They do a very, very good job. You'll remember from news not too long ago that they will be uh, directing some of the Moon Knight shows. They've also developed their own Lovecraftian uh, indie films, and their latest one was Synchronic. But I would highly recommend this if you like their work. So... Anyway, let's get back right down to business. What happens in this show, essentially? Well, Dan, unfolding all of these archival footages, starts to learn exactly what happens from Melody's perspective. She's thrown into a cult. Not thrown, but she realises that there's a cult in the Vissa building, and they're worshipping Kalego, a demon deity, uh, which is essentially lives in a different dimension, and a world within our own world, beyond the veil. Uh, which can only be accessed at a period uh, where a comet, the ferryman, goes over sky and then they have to perform a ritual, a blood sacrifice. Now there are some interesting elements throughout this. We see, uh, you know, a snuff film. We see um, sort of old, I don't know, 40s film and footage sort of being put together and uh, a pre-Twilight Zone, Twilight Zone. It's a very nicely shot and the story itself, yeah, it... It does fall into some tropes here, there, and everywhere. But again, like I say, get up to the episode 5. Episode 5 is where it starts to fall apart a little bit too much. My excitement for season 2 is still there. 
but yeah, it's 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 a very 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 good show on a technical basis, very well shot, and we have this haunting, haunting melody (pun intended) running through uh, this show, which is actually a prayer to Kalego, the deity god worshipped by the Voss Society. We actually run between three time zones. So there's the Voss Society, uh, and which. Uh, Presumably, I believe it was in the 40s or something along those lines. Anyway, uh, and then we have 1994 and then obviously present day. Now, as the footage starts to unfold, the deity Kalego manifests itself in the screens to Dan. Uh, and Dan, on the lead up to all of this, actually begins communicating with Melody somehow. Because the veil themselves can be broken, it seems. Not actually explained in the show, not properly. Not properly, they just managed to find themselves in dreams or in workings that somehow through the screens. It's, it's again, it's actually left quite vague, but I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And then it builds to the tumultuous end. The end of Dan, the end of Melody, the end of Kalego. Not quite. So on the lead up to the big, big, big crescendo, Dan has finished the archival footage of everything. Uh, Virgil Davenport has decommissioned him. He's paid him. He said, "Leave, leave. Don't, don't, don't come back here." Uh, but Dan obviously is aware that Virgil Davenport would probably want to figure out exactly what happened to his brother. Yes, that's right. His brother Sam, or Samuel, was the leader of this cult uh, in 1994, which Melody wound herself up in. And so uh, Virgil, Virgil Davenport, and Dan. Uh, communicate once more right at the very end Dan wants to try and save Melody somehow uh, he believes he can reach her in the other world beyond the veil open the doorway and go through and he does yes he does and this is where it starts to get a bit tropey a bit too convoluted Virgil Davenport had an employee working and watching over Dan, Dan actually turns out to be Melody's mother. Again, quite cliche, a bit tropey. Uh, and they're witches. They are able to open the doorway and keep it open, but somehow not let Kalego come through. Not explained. Doesn't really delve into that because, you know, when you've got tropes there, hey, best left unsaid, I guess you could say. And so Dan goes forth into the other world. The world within worlds. Or whatever you want to call it. Saves Melody. Melody gets flung back into our world. Somehow, Samuel is there and somehow pulls her through. But it's not explained, it's not shown that Samuel goes through with her. It, it's left quite ambiguous and obviously open for the next season. Now, Daniel, or Dan, wakes up in a hospital bed. But dazed, confused, what's going on? Where am I? Because, of course, last he saw he was in the world between worlds. Uh, again, sort of Stranger Things-esque, I guess you could say. And, yeah, he's in 1994, somehow. And that obviously leaves it open to Season 2. But I'm very in, very excited. I'm very excited to see how Season 2 goes. Um, now, it is left intentionally, uh, I guess, open-ended. This could be done, one and done. Or you could have our season two but I, I do hope and I think that they probably will make another one now in terms of is he actually in 1994 I would say so I would say so uh, he could of course be stuck in the realm and Kalego could be messing with him because uh, Bobby Melody's mother uh, did warn Dan that he Kalego is uh, lonely he's desperate and he will try to convince anyone to stay in that world, which is actually why Melody was there, because he she was tricked into staying there. Uh, so, there's the ending explained. Now, overall, review, I really enjoyed this show. Episode 5 starts to take a little bit of a dip uh, from episode 5, but it stays and, and ends on quite a high. Uh, the acting is good throughout, even from child actors, which is quite rare. Uh, the monster design of Kalego, I enjoyed, actually. I enjoyed all the occult aspects of it. I thought that was uh, interestingly done. I think the addition of a snuff film was smart. It's Yes, it's a trope, but it's a trope we haven't seen for quite some time. Overall, thoroughly enjoyed this series. Good bit of horror. They could have leaned into it a little bit more and been much, much, much 
you know, more horrified uh, and scary, terrifying. But I understand what they were doing with it. I just hope that moving forwards we could get a little bit more uh, off the scares. But it was good. It was brutal. So if you've seen it, let me know what you guys think down below. Uh, where do you think that they could make it a bit better? Where do you think they uh, excelled? Let me know your thoughts down below. If you're new here, do hit subscribe. Thank you so much for watching there, ladies and gents. Hit subscribe, give the video a like, and follow me over on Twitter and Instagram. Links in the description box. Thanks so much. Take care.